We utilize uh, 1 John 1, 9, which gives us the opportunity, as it says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And it's the cleansed vessel or the cleansed soul that has fellowship with God. And fellowship also means the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, who is our true teacher and our true mentor. Without him, we could not understand the Bible and the Word of God. So therefore, we spend a moment of silent prayer to name any sins to God the Father, if necessary, to ensure that filling of the Spirit and thereby go forward in the plan. So with a moment of silent prayer, let us pray. And Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you this evening in praise and in worship and in glorification of your name, and also the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have this evening to come before you in praise and in worship and also in the study of your word. And Father, we ask that you help us to concentrate and focus on all that you have for us this evening. Help us, help us to lift up our hearts in song and in praise and also in concentration of your word so that our souls are edified and thereby we learn your word and apply it in our daily lives, glorifying you in all that we do. And so, Father, we ask that you continue to watch over our local assembly. We ask that you protect and guide it, that you provide for our every need and lead us in the truth of your word and also service within our local community to glorify you and to preach the gospel message to those who are lost and dying in this community and throughout the world and also to edify the souls of those who need your word, Father, which is each and every one of us, and who desire your word, to edify their soul and build it up through the teaching of your word and teaching it accurately as your word dictates. So, Father, we also thank you for our nation. We ask that you watch over it, protect and guide it, to be with our president and his family, protecting and guiding them, leading him in all his decision-making authority to honor your word, your divine establishment principles, and our constitution. And Father, we also pray for our military that stands on guard on our behalf around the world. We ask that you protect and guide them and lead them in all their endeavors, bring healing to those who have been wounded, either physically or spiritually, and also for those who have given the greatest sacrifice, Father, and laid down their lives on our behalf. We thank you for their service and for their sacrifice, and we ask that you be with their loved ones and give healing and comfort in their souls due to their great loss by your word and by your spirit. So, Father, we thank you again for this time that we have together, and we ask that you help us to lift up our hearts in song and in praise. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, Mary Ellen is not with us this evening, so, Terry, would you like to come forward and lead us in our doxology? (laughs) Gotcha. I'm going to take my jacket off because I'm sweating now. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O my soul. I worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. O my soul, I worship your holy name. Thank you very much and please be seated. All right, thank you very much for the song service. And now let's turn our Bible. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1. And our memory verse continues to be Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, which means that's a waste of life, but be filled with the Spirit. So this is a verse that gives us a contrast. Rather than operating and living in sin, instead throw that off because it's a waste of time, but then be filled with the Spirit going forward inside the plan of God the Father. So the filling of the Spirit is what's important for the spiritual life, especially in the church age. It's how we learn. It's how we grow. That's how we apply. It's how we glorify God 
God on a consistent basis. So we find ourselves now in the book of Ephesians, and uh, we've been doing uh, some introduction. I've got uh, one more night of introduction for you this evening. Hopefully I can get through all that I have for you this evening. But one more night of introduction, and I know uh, it's been a few nights of introduction, but I think it's very important because we are going to go through this book uh, somewhat quickly. We're not going to go through it word by word as we otherwise would, but we are going to hit it topic by topic as they come throughout this book. So again, uh, I think especially tonight with uh, a lot of context in regard to what the bu- this book is all about, I think will be very helpful as we go through that, giving you a baseline and uh, an, an overall uh, understanding of what the book is so that when we go through this, you'll have a reference point. So the book of Ephesians, again, uh, uh, Ephesians is in that place called Ephesus, again, uh, right here in what was known as Asia Minor uh, back in the day, a part of the Greek Empire at one point, but at the time of the writing of scriptures, it was part of the Roman Empire, but it still had very much Greek influence in its society and in its philosophies. And especially uh, both now with the Greek and the Roman false gods, the pagan gods as we would call that, these areas were steeped in that, had all kinds of different temples to different gods, and so Paul came through in one of his missionary journeys, his second and really third missionary journey, came through and told them the gospel of Jesus Christ and witnessed the truth of God's word to them, and many of them accepted that and believed it. And as a result, then Paul wrote this book of Ephesians, not just to Ephesus, not just to that location, but really to the entire region, because this is what's called a circular book, uh, and a book that was to be passed, or a letter that was to be passed from city to city so that they could all learn the word of God as Paul was teaching it back in the day. So, again, this letter is written to them, and we uh, have been noting the content of this letter, and the overall theme of this is really to fulfill God's overall and eternal purpose to complete His body. That's what this book of Ephesians is all about, completing the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember, we are the body, He is the head, and ultimately, He is God as well. So, again, we're the body of God, not just the body of Jesus Christ, but the body of God as well, as He is the head. And so, ultimately, that's the eternal purpose, and Paul writes this book in regard to that. As I've given you already, there are seven main themes, and this is going to be our basis for outline, even though in your notes this evening at the end, I've given you a more detailed outline of the overall book, kind of almost sentence, or I should say uh, verse by verse, Uh, but we're not going to go over all that, but I'm going to use that as a frame of reference. But ultimately, these are the seven main topics as to what is found in this book. And it starts with our predestination, that from eternity past, God knew you, He knew about you, He created you, He knew that you would be created, and he also knew that you would be uh, born into this world with a sin nature, and therefore needed a Savior to overcome that sin nature. And therefore, in eternity past, God knew about you personally and said, you know what, I'm going to send my son. What was that pop all about? I'm going to send my son, and I'm going to have him pay the penalty for you on the cross, and that he will die for your sins so that you personally could have eternal life. God also, from eternity past, knew that you personally would believe in Jesus. Jesus Christ. As a result of him knowing that from eternity past, he predestined you to salvation in time and then a spiritual walk uh, during your life here on planet earth and then to an eternal state where you would be with him forever and ever in heaven. That's all part of predestination, and Paul alludes to that in the first part of this book. Then we're also going to talk about Christ's headship over the body. Again, he is the head, we are the body. What does that mean? We're going to talk about the building of the church. Again, we are not only a body, but we're a building. We're the temple of God as well, as Ephesians chapter 2 will lead us into. Then in our fourth through seventh point, we're going to understand the mystery of Jesus Christ. And again, the mystery that the Old Testament saints missed out on, the mystery that the Pharisees missed out on, the mystery that they didn't understand, the mystery that was given to them in a picture in the Old Testament, revealed in the person of Jesus Christ, and now revealed to us plainly in the New Testament, and now we understand the person of Christ and who he is and what he has done for us. We'll talk about that. We're going to talk a little bit about spiritual gifts as well when we get to chapter 4, and remember, each of you have a spiritual gift with a ministry and a 
service that you have. We'll talk about that. Then we're also going to talk about the church as the bride of Christ. And that really is uh, uh, given to us an example of our human relationship of husband and wife, but it really is talking about the mystery of Christ and his church. Not only are we a temple of God, not only are we the body of God, but we are currently the bride of Christ and will be the wife of Christ in the eternal state. Talking about that close, intimate relationship that we will have with him forever and ever and ever. And then in chapter 6, it talks about the warfare that we're a part of, but also the armor that God has given to us, both the defensive and offensive weaponry that God has given to us so that we can withstand the onslaught of Satan as we live inside of his cosmic system. And ultimately, that's withstanding the onslaught of the temptation to sin, both from within and from without. We can overcome all things through Christ who strengthens us. So we're going to talk about those things as our main theme. But remember, I told you about this briefly, and I just want to go over th through this uh, uh, for you again. Remember, this past fall, we studied the book of Galatians, and Galatians was written first by Paul, and it really talked about our adoption, and it really talked about Christ and Christ crucified and how we've been set free from the law through the person of Christ. We've been redeemed and reconciled through the person of Christ. It was a little book, and then later on, uh, Paul wrote the great theses called the book of Romans. And so he wrote Galatians first as an introduction, and then he sealed the deal, as we would say, with the book of Romans, and so there's a relationship between those two books. Similarly, we see between the book of Colossians, which Paul wrote first, which was an introduction as to the body of Christ and Christ being the head of that body. Now, later on, he wrote the book of Ephesians, which we're studying now, which talks in more detail and solidifies that even more. What's happening here that's making this pop? So now we find here in the book of Ephesians a greater thesis in regard to the body of Christ and uh, Jesus Christ being the head. So that, there's a relationship uh, there. And that at the same time, remember the Gnostics. Again, the Gnostics were a spin-off cult from Christianity and the early church. And the Gnostics were ones who believed in the person of Jesus Christ. And there were really two differences in the Gnostic belief. Most of them believed that Jesus Christ was a good man, but he was not God. And therefore, he was not the God-man, and therefore, they don't believe in the person of Jesus Christ and the incarnation of Christ and, and truly the payment of the penalty for our sins. Others believe that he was God, but he didn't take on humanity. Therefore, he couldn't pay for our sins on the cross through his humanity. So Gnostics kind of went off in two different directions, but in both cases, they denied something in regard to the person and work of Jesus Christ. They believed in the person, they would say the name, but they didn't understand fully what he was all about and truly could not come to faith in him because they didn't understand the totality of the God-man, Jesus Christ. So the same kind of heresies that were plaguing the Colossian church were also filtering into the, to the Ephesian church and that general area as well. So Paul writes to that group, to the Ephesians and then to the overall territory to try to tell them, hey, this is Jesus Christ. He is the God man. He is the head because he is, uh, because he is God. He is the head because of the perfect work that he completed for us on the cross. And oh, by the way, we are his body. So they, Paul writes this book in regard to the false doctrines that were out there trying to get them to understand the truth. But the differences between Colossians and the book of Ephesians are this. In the book of Colossians, it really talked about the person of Christ and the dignity of Christ, as we would say, who he is, what he is, and how he accomplished salvation for mankind, and then therefore being the head of the church, the God-man, Jesus Christ. But now when we get into the book of Ephesians, it still alludes to the person of Christ as the head, but Ephesians is all about what? You and I. It's all about us because it's about the body of Christ. And it's really given to us so that we are strengthened in our knowledge. We are encouraged in our knowledge. We are exhorted in our knowledge of the position that we have in the person of Christ and that we are his body. And so it strengthens our belief, it strengthens our faith, solidifies it knowing that we are in the body of Christ and that's what we are. And at the same time, it gives us the working function of that body as well. It exhorts us and again encourages us to 
function and operate as members of the body of Christ and how we have a spiritual gift and we ought to use that to serve in love towards one another. So that's what this book of Ephesians is all about. It's really about us, about the body of Christ and how we should function, work, and serve not only God but also our fellow man and also to give us that strength and encouragement of our position in Jesus Christ. So when we talk about the outline of the book, again, there's a whole, this is a whole major section when we, in regard to the outline of this book of Ephesians. <clears throat> and I'm really going to break it down. As I said, in the handouts that I have, uh, uh, if you have those, if you've printed those, uh, you can get that. It will be up on the website at some point as well. Uh, but ultimately, if you need that, I can get that for you. I've got an exhaustive outline. I'm not going to go over that detail this evening. But I want to hit some of the highlights for you because when we talk about the outline of this book, there are really two, two breakdowns that we see. The first is theological. Now, the word theological, again, comes from the Greek theos. It means God. Theos means God. And then that ogical at the end ultimately means a study of or ology. It means the study of. So theology or theological means the study of God. And so the first three chapters that we have in this book of Ephesians tell us about God and the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and about the Holy Spirit. And it does it in this way. In chapter 1, we're going to talk about God's plan of salvation. So it reassures us that we are saved. It reassures us that God, from eternity past, knew about us. He knew that we would would need a Savior, and He provided that Savior for us. And through our non-meritorious act of faith in Him, then He did save us. He brought us into relationship with Himself. He reconciled us. He redeemed us. And then, oh, by the way, He gave us His Spirit as a seal for the promise of eternal life in Him. So we're going to see that in chapter 1, God's plan of salvation, how we went about it and how it impacts us and what it means to us. Again, giving us assurance to go forward in God's plan here on planet Earth. Then when we get to chapter 2, we're going to talk about God's way of salvation. Okay, So we're going to talk in a little bit more detail of now, yes, we have salvation, what does that mean? And again, let's just turn to Ephesians chapter 2, and uh, I'll give you this verse because you you, you probably know it very well and you've seen it. But the way of salvation is in verse 8. Chapter 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not as the result of works, that no one should boast. Again, it's all the grace plan of God. It's what He has done for us. And we receive it, not by any works that we can perform. Again, you can't be good enough to save yourself. But God and Jesus Christ were good enough to bring salvation to us. And that's why on Sunday, remember, and I'm going to continue to remind you of this as we go through the book of Ephesians, because this is a main theme, and that main theme is you don't have to be perfect, but you do have to be good. And what does that mean? Well, again, perfect, you are already perfect. So stop trying to be perfect. Again, many people in religion are trying to be perfect so that they can be saved. You can't do it. So stop trying. Because, oh, by the way, God has already made you perfect. The moment that you believed in Jesus Christ, you were uh, uh, placed in union with Christ, and you were made perfect in His eyes. But you do have to be good. So you can't be perfect. You can't do that on your own. So don't try. God's made you that way. But you do have to be good. What does that mean? Just follow God's plan. Now, this does not go for, you know, perfect and good have nothing to do with your salvation. Again, you can't be perfect enough to save yourself. You can't be good enough to save yourself. It's not by works, lest any man should boast. But when you believe in Jesus Christ, you've been made perfect. And now that you have been made perfect, God just says, walk in my plan. Walk in my will. Do what my word says and continue to have fellowship with me. That's what I mean by you don't have to be perfect, but you do have to be good. Just walk in God's plan. Walk in the goodness and the holiness that God has made you. And then the third chapter in regard to theology and the study of God, we're going to see that Paul was given the task of revealing this plan of salvation to the church and to all of mankind. So Paul's revelation of God's plan is what we're going to see in chapter 3, where he was the one set aside to bring that message to the Gentiles. He also brought it to the Jews, but specifically for the Gentiles, Paul was set aside to bring that message of God's plan of salvation. And so that's what we see in the first three chapters, again, in the theological study of it. Then we see in the second half of this book, again, chapters 4, 5, and 6, we now see the believer's walk. 
And so this aspect is all about you and I. How should we, now that we know of God's plan of salvation, now that we have obtained God's way of salvation, now that his plan has been revealed to us, as noted in the first three chapters, what are we to do? And so that's what the last four chapters are all about. And so in the fourth chapter, we're going to see the high calling of the believers. You know, it's a very high calling that God has given to you. The fact that you are saved, the fact that you believe in Jesus Christ is a high calling. You see, not every member of the human race has that calling. Many people do not believe, as you know. And many people haven't been called into the family of God. But you have, and you've received that calling. You've answered the phone, as it were. You know, the phone was ringing off the hook, and it, it rings off the hook for every member of the human race. But you were the one who answered it. That's called faith. But yet God brought you into that family based on that faith, and you heeding his call. And it's a high calling. Again, it's a high status that you've been given. Again, we are royal priests. We are royal ambassadors. It's a very high calling that God has given to us. We have role. We have responsibility. We ought to be the ambassadors to a lost and dying world. We ought to be the body of Christ that functions here on planet Earth. He, doesn't come, he could, but he doesn't come down in this church age and do everything himself. It's through us that his will and word and plan get accomplished. And it's a high calling that we have stepped into and that we have been given. Then we also understand that we need to have suitable behavior. As Ephesians chapter 5, 18, our memory verse says, again, do not get drunk with wine. It's a waste of life, but be filled with the Spirit. Again, live a life suitable of the behavior of a believer. Don't be living like the uh, sinner out there in Satan's cosmic system. Live in God's plan. Live in that high calling that you have been given. Live in the power that God has given to you. Live in the fellowship that God has for you. Again, live suitable uh, in behavior for what a believer should be. And then in chapter 6, we have the warfare of the believer. And so there we see the angelic conflict. When we get to chapter 6, we'll talk about that angelic conflict. We'll talk about the great warfare that we're all a part of, and especially the unseen warfare. But we're also going to spend time talking about the power that God has given to us so that no way we are defeated. No way we're defeated. And the fact of the matter is, if you simply believe in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you are not defeated in the angelic conflict. Even if you live in sin the rest of your life after your salvation, you still are victorious. But God also gives us strength so that we can live victoriously. You see, there's victory that we've been given, there's victory that we can live in each and every day. And God wants us to live in that victory that he has given to us. And to remind us that that victory that's been given to us can never get taken away. But we may not live in it. Do you see the difference? You see, the victory can't get taken away, but you may not live in it. It's as if you know, somebody bought you a house and you can go and live in that house any dime you want, and it's yours for all of eternity. But you say, you know what? I don't want to live in the house. And you live out on the street somewhere. Or you live, you know, in the woods or somewhere else. You live anywhere else but that house. Guess what? The house is still yours. The victory is still yours. But whether you live in it or not is up to you. Do you want to live in the house or do you not want to live in the house? Do you want to live in the plan of God or do you not want to live in the plan of God? But the house is still yours. The plan of God is still yours. The victory is still yours. So God gives us this encouragement to say, you know what? I've given you victory. Now I've given you strength and power so that you can live victoriously each and every day. And that's what we're going to do when we get to chapter 6 and understand those principles. And so as we've been understanding this, again, this is the theological and the, uh, the aspect, again, the study of God. Then there's the anthropological, the study of man and the believer and how we should be walking each and every day. And in this scripture, that phrase, in Christ or with Christ or through Christ, is used over 30, about 35 times within this, within this book. And that is a very popular phrase that Paul used throughout all his different epistles that he wrote, that we are in Christ, talking about our union in Christ, our position in Christ. But you know what? In the book of Ephesians, he stresses that more than any other book. And he uses that phrase more here than any other book. Because again, he's trying to strengthen that, to remind us and to assure us that we are in a fantastic position, a high lofty position that God has given to us. 
that no one can take away. So this is all part of, you know, being in, in Christ also is all about the riches of God's glory. Let's go back to chapter 1 and in verse 3. And in verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So again, we have wealth that is there for us. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies that is in Christ. And again, we don't earn or deserve these on our own, but in our relationship with Christ, being in Christ, we receive these things. And it's tremendous wealth a tremendous inheritance. And again, I could talk to you about the physical wealth that is there for us. When we get to the, uh, to the eternal state, there's the New Jerusalem, a city that's going to hover up above planet Earth. It's going to be God's throne room. And up there, is, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as Jesus said in the Gospel of John, I go and prepare a place for you. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. And I go there to prepare a place for you. And oh, by the way, when we see the description of that city, the city alone, we see it made of what? Gold, precious gems, pearls that are, as I'll say, ginormous, okay? <laughs> ginormous, okay? We can't even fathom. And we're going to see perfect pearls as the gates. We're going to see all kinds of different gems and jewels and diamonds and rubies and all kinds of things that are the walls. And then the streets are going to be paved with gold. Again, that's riches in regard to what we would think riches in the earthly realm, but we have that plus, plus the spiritual blessings that God has for us, the tremendous power, the tremendous assets, the tremendous resources that are available to us in time, and the tremendous experience that we're going to have, and the tremendous body we're going to have in the eternal state. So all of this is, co is combined in what is called the wealth of God. That is given to us. And so, again, Paul is telling us this is wealth that you have. This is wealth that God has given to us. Remember these things. Be strengthened by these things. Be encouraged by these things. And so, again, it's based on our position in Christ. As we stand, you know, and this is, you know, the we are, okay? We are, and I've got about 10 things I'm going to give you. I said, well, maybe more than 10 things, but about 10 things I'm going to remind you of, and we're going to note these when we get to each of these verses. First and foremost, we are in Christ. Again, us and Jesus Christ are like this. We're one. We're not two separate beings. We're one. We're one with Christ. So we are in Christ, Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. We are also blessed with every blessing, as we noted in verse 3. We also are chosen in Him. Did you know that God from eternity past personally chose you? Picked you out of the whole crowd and said, that's the one I want? He chose you from eternity past. We'll talk about that in our predestination and what that means. But again, just how fabulous it is that God thought from billions of years ago to choose you, to choose me out from the entire world and give us these blessings, and give us this tremendous life that we have. Did you know that also we're adopted in Him? And remember when we studied the book of Galatians, that was a major emphasis in the book of Galatians, our adoption. Again, we weren't born of God as Jesus Christ was born of God, but we we're adopted into the family of God. And as you know, under the Roman laws of adoption, it was all the rights as if we were a natural son. And so, therefore, being adopted means it gives us all kinds of rights inside the family of God, all kinds of privileges, and again, heirs to the inheritance that is God's. We are also what? In the Beloved. And again, we are in Christ, we are in the Beloved. Again, it's the same, uh, same person. The Beloved here is Jesus Christ. But who is the Beloved? Again, the loved one of God. So again... If you ever think that you're unloved in this life, just throw that out the window because God loves you. And he loves you as much as what? He loved his son. You see, if you are in Christ and Christ is loved by God, guess what? You too are loved by God. And again, we see that by association, but the New Testament tells us that plainly time and time again, that God loved us before we loved him. So again, we are in the beloved. So we are loved by God, just as his son was loved by God. 
We are also what? Redeemed in him. Again, we've been purchased from the slave market of sin. We've been purchased from our sins. No longer do our sins have a hold over us. No longer does Satan have a hold over us. We are now anew in Jesus Christ, redeemed in him. Then we're also going to see that we are given an inheritance because of Christ. And again, that eternal reward, eternal blessings that are waiting for us. And because whatever God gives to Jesus Christ, guess what? We too will receive. As God said, sit at my, the right hand of my throne, we too will be sitting at the right hand of the throne of God the Father because of our union with Jesus Christ. Old Testament saints won't be doing that, nor will the, tri- uh, the millennial saints or the tribulational saints. They won't be sitting at the right hand of God, but we will be because we have that promise in the church age. We also have a hope that is to the praise and the glory in, uh, uh, of God in Christ. Again, a hope. And remember, a hope isn't a wish list. It's a confident expectation. And again, it's to the praise of His glory. As all of creation sings hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah to God, guess what? We're going to be receiving it too. Because we're the body of Christ. And if we're the body of Christ and Christ, excuse me, Christ is getting uh, praised, guess what? We too get praised. And we receive that. Did we do anything? Absolutely not. But God gave us a position. Again, that high calling that we're talking about. At the same time, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, and that is an installment for the inheritance that is waiting for us. You see, God just didn't say, hey, I've got an inheritance for you in the future. No, He gave us a down payment on that inheritance. What was that down payment? The indwelling of God the Holy Spirit and being sealed by Him. And when, when we believe at the moment of our salvation, He enters into us, He seals us, and no one or nothing can take that away. The down payment for the inheritance that we will have in eternal life, that we will have the riches and rewards and blessings of the eternal state. We will have the inheritance. We will be seated at the right hand of God, being the body of Jesus Christ. It's all based on the inheritance, but the down payment that has been given to us already. And then also we understand that we are made alive, raised and seated with him in the heavenlies. And Ephesians chapter 2 will tell us about that when we understand that. Again, as he has resurrection life, we too are living in resurrection life right now. But one day we'll receive a resurrection body as he has. And we'll be seated with him in those heavenly places. And then we also are created in Christ for good works. You see, now this is our walk. This is the behavior. You see, God didn't just bring us into the family for the sake of bringing us into the family. He brought us in so that now we could function and operate as members of his body. And everything that God does is what? Good and righteous and holy. And so therefore, when we function and operate as members of the body of Christ, we're going to do things that are good, righteous, and holy. We're going to serve for, for God. We're going to serve for each other. You see, we've been created to do these good works, to give the gospel message, to encourage the lost in this dying world, to help the fellow believer, to help the reversionistic believer, to help our, our, our friends, our relatives, neighbors, co-workers, whatever the case. We've been created for these good works, again, to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then we also are partakers of the promise in Christ. And again, the promise that that, uh, was given to Christ, we get to receive that as well. The promise that we have in Christ, that we will have a resurrection body, we will be in heaven. Again, we're partakers of that. So we'll talk more about that in Ephesians. Well, let's just look at Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6. We just read 3, 8, and 9, but, or 2, 8, 9, but 3, 6. And it says, to be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. So as it says, the fellow partakers of the promise in Christ through the gospel. And again, we are entered into that that, that inheritance, we're entered into the, 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 uh, the relationship being partakers because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And we've been entered into that royal family as a result. 
then we also are given access to God through, uh, through faith in Christ. So you have access at any time, 24 by 7. Anytime you want to talk to God, you can talk to God. You see, the unbeliever can't talk to God anytime they want to talk to God. You see, the unbeliever first has to get saved. And the only thing the unbeliever can talk to God about is what? I believe in your son, Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for my sins. It's the only thing they can talk to God about. But we have his access 24 by 7. We can petition him. We can, uh, we can uh, uh, ask him for, pray, uh, for uh, in, uh, in, in intercessory prayers. I'm trying to spit out. Intercessory for others, petitions for ourselves. And also praise and glory and thanksgiving. Again, anytime we can talk to God and we have access because of his grace, because of what he has done for us, not because of what we do for him. And so the church, ultimately, when we understand all of these aspects, we're going to understand that the church is not an organization. You know, as much as people want to think that it's, oh, you know, you know, you got the big pope there in Rome, and then, then you've got to be under the organization, and this is how people get to Christ, through the organization. No. We're not an organization, but we are an organism. In other words, we're a body. We're a functioning, working, operating entity. And it's all believers in any generation collectively make up the body of Christ. And that's why you see different churches and, you know, this church has a ministry in that area. That church has a ministry in this area. Every church is part of the body of Christ. All of you have a specific ministry within the body of Christ. And not all of you do the same thing. Again, we all are, have our own uh, direction and our own gift that we function and operate in, but when you put it all together, you see the entire organism. And so again, we're not an organization, but we are an organism. And that's why denominations should never, never, never be part of Christianity. Never. Never should have an, a denomination, because then it becomes an organization and not an organism. God wants us to be a living, breathing, functioning uh, body that is the, a part of his son, Jesus Christ. And so we have riches as well. So we, when we understand all of this and understand that we are that functioning, working body of Jesus Christ, that we are an organization, excuse me, we're not an organization, but we are an organism. We also see our riches in Christ, and they come from these specific areas. And those specific areas that our riches come from are by His grace. You see, everything we have is by the grace of God. It's because He's done all the work, and He just offers it to us. As I've told you time and time again, it's like you go to a party, and they come around you know, with uh, you know, various little uh, cocktails on the, uh, or, or I should say hors d'oeuvres, on the hors d'oeuvre plate. Somebody else has prepared them. The host has prepared them. The host is now serving them to you. All you've got to do is pick it up and eat it, and it becomes yours. That's the grace of God. He does everything for us, for our salvation and after our salvation. He teaches us. He leads us. He gives us His Word. So again, it's the grace of God that has done everything for us. It's also we have these riches in Christ because of the peace that He has given to us. And again, the peace being no longer are we enemies of God. You see, when we were uh, uh, under sin, when we were an unbeliever, we had sin upon our soul, and we were at enmity with God. We were the enemies of God because of sin in us. But yet God brought us peace. He reconciled us. He paid for our sins. And through our faith, He said, okay, now we have peace. And because of that peace, we can enjoy the riches of God forever and ever and ever. Our riches are also given to us because of His will. Again, this is what He wanted to do. It's the plan that He has designed. And from eternity past, God says, this is what I want to do for you, and this is my will for you. And so as a result of what God wants to do for us, again, we have His riches. Also, we have his riches because of his pleasure and his purpose. And again, will and purpose, somewhat synonymous in, in term, but purpose is more of what's the end game? What's the end result? You see, God has a purpose for each and every one of us, a purpose for all of our lives. Collectively, he has a purpose for the overall body of Christ. 
And it's also part of his pleasure. Again, in other words, God enjoys doing these things for us. God enjoys providing for us. God enjoys working through us. This gives him joy and pleasure. And this is why he does it. At the same time, these riches that we have in time in the eternal state, when God is able to bestow that victory on us, when there's going to be that great marriage ceremony and the great marriage feast in the eternal state, that you can read about in Roman, uh, excuse me, the book of Revelation, chapter 18 and 19. With that great celebration, it's going to be a great victory celebration that we're going to be, uh, be a part of and receive. And it's going to give God tremendous joy and pleasure. He also does it for his own glory. Again, we receive glory. He does it for our glory, but also because of his glory. And again, because God is able to do this for us, he should be praised because of all that he has done for us. All that he has done that we don't earn nor deserve. But yet he does it for us anyway. He receives glory and accolade for that. Also because of the calling and inheritance. Again, the riches that we have because he called us into the family. And when we receive the call, now he's given us an inheritance. And so therefore the riches that he has provided uh, for us, are, uh, are, uh, or that is the result of our calling and the inheritance that he has given to us. Also, his power and strength. God is able to do that. We, can't, we couldn't overcome our sins. We couldn't earn our way into heaven. We couldn't gain these riches and glories, uh, glory on our own. But God has the power. God has the strength. And really demonstrated by Jesus Christ and the cross and what he went through in his humanity to endure that suffering and the torture and the pain yet doing it without sin. The power and the strength to endure you know, in, in regard to humanity, but even beyond that, the power and strength of deity to save us, to create us, to change this body that's decaying into a body that will never decay, never get hungry, never get sick, never uh, get tired. God has the power to do that, and so the riches are, are there because of his power and his strength. He also does it because of his love. Because God loves us. He has given us these riches. He provides these riches for us. He gave us His Son because He loves us. Even when we were sinners, He loved us. And now He continues to love us post-salvation, post our uh, belief in Jesus Christ, and the inheritance are given as a result. Also, because of His workmanship, Again, he did the work. It's part of grace. He did the work. Between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the work of salvation was accomplished for all of mankind. And he continues to work in our lives each and every day by his word and by his spirit that is inside of us. Jesus Christ being our mediator in heaven who takes our petitions and defends us in the eternal state and makes sure that our prayers are answered by God the Father. Jesus being the mediator, the intercessory. Working, working, working. God the Father, hearing our prayers and answering our prayers. Working, working, working. You know, uh, many times in your life, whether you know it or not, God has, uh, God has given a command to a guardian angel to get you out of a jam, to save your life when otherwise you should be dead. And I can account to that many times myself. Okay, Get you out of a jam. Save your life when your life should be taken away. But he did what? He put a charge. He put a command to a guardian angel to save you physically. And then many times to, uh, to not only your guardian angel, but to the herald of angels to fight a warfare that's invisible going on around you so that you could be sustained. You could go forward and you could accomplish. Again, God does that for you. And he works and he works and he works. Day in and day, day out. As we have been studying with the men in regard to you know, the, uh, the, the uh, systematic theology study that we're doing, we're talking about the work of Christ and the atonement that God has given to man. And one of the things that we talked about the, uh, last week was uh, in regard to the work of God. And remember, he created the earth or recreated the earth and created man and animal and plant life uh, in six days. And on the seventh day, he rested. And man was brought into this world under rest. Again, he was at rest. But then what did man do? Man sinned in the Garden of Eden. 
And then what did God have to do? Okay, rest is over, time to get back to work. And from that day forward, God worked and worked and worked to provide salvation for mankind, to provide for each and every one of us, and he continues to provide for us each and every day. God also, the riches of God are given to us in Christ because of his spirit, the indwelling of God, the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the spirit working within us. Again, that down payment, the inheritance, the sealing. Again, the spirit working within us and the spirit working for us each and every day. And then also, uh, because the riches of God are not given because of our offering and sacrifice, but because of God's offering and sacrifice. And what was God's offering and sacrifice? His own son, the person of Jesus Christ. He offered him and he sacrificed him so that our sins could be paid for and so that we could receive the riches of God's inheritance. And God has done that for us through his own offering and through his own sacrifice. That's why God says, cows and bulls and sacrifice, I do not want, but a body I do. And the body he's talking about was his son, Jesus Christ. That's what the book of Hebrews is all about, the offering and sacrifice that God made for us. And then also, as we uh, see the last part of this book, again, talking about picking up and putting on the full armor of God. And it's that armor that you can pick up and put on that also gives you the riches that are found in Christ. The armor itself is riches. You know, you, you think back, you know, and again, I know some of it's fairy tale, but, you know, King Richard and the Knights of the Round Table and, you know, Sir Lancelot and all of those things. Well, the knights were what? Knights in shining armor. You know, they had riches. They had wealth because they were a knight. Well, guess what? When God says, pick up and put on the full armor of God, basically he's saying, you have been knighted into the family of God, and you have riches, and you have privilege, and you have authority. And so this armor of God that we see uh, gives us uh, riches and blessing and power and strength to fight the angelic conflict, to be victorious in the angelic conflict. And oh, by the way, when the victor, when the victor wins the battle, what does the victor get? The spoils. You know, whatever, he, whatever his enemy that he defeated was theirs, Guess what? The victor gets to take those. So because of the victory of Jesus Christ to defeat Satan and sin and the uh, fallen angels, and then our little bit of battling and fighting within that, based on our position in Christ and the armor that God has given to us, guess what? We're going to win the spoils of Satan and his fallen angelic forces. In other words, who knows? planets that God made for them, abodes that he made for them, authority that he gave to them. We don't know the detail of what that kingdom is, but we know they had kingdoms. They're going to lose those kingdoms, and guess what? We're going to receive them because of Christ, and we're going to enjoy them for all of eternity. And whatever authority or power, whatever goes along with that, we are going to be able to uh, uh, utilize those things and receive those things for all of eternity eternity. So again, these are all part of the blessings that God gives to us, all part of the riches that God has for us. Again, we have the riches of his grace. We have the unfathomable riches that are in the person of Christ. And we're also going to see the riches of his glory. We see all of this terminology. And with that, we are also instructed by Paul to be filled up with all the fullness of God, to attain a unity of faith based on the knowledge of the Son, Jesus Christ, so that we mature, we grow spiritually to a measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And again, a lot of lofty words there. Again, that's what this book is all about, raising you up so that you can experience more and more and more of the blessings that God has for you. But many times when we stay as a baby believer, We don't know these things. We don't get these things. We don't understand these things. And when I say we don't get them, I mean we don't understand them. So we don't think they're there. But the Word of God tells us they are there. And the more we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the more we're going to experience those things. And that's why it says, you know, grow to a mature man, to a stature, to the fullness of Christ. 
have that Christ-like nature, and enjoy the things that Christ enjoyed in that super grace and that spiritual mature status. And then also, we are not only to, 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 to be filled up with all the fullness of God and the fullness of Christ, but more importantly, we're to be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18, be filled with my Spirit. And when we fill up this body of ours, this temple that is God, again, we will experience the riches of God like we never have before. And we'll live a fantastic spiritual life in time with blessings that also come in the eternal state. All right, so I uh, got through it all as much as I wanted to. Again, in your notes, uh, you know, uh, then on there's a detailed outline of what the uh, rest of this book is going to be about. And so we'll note those things when we get there as we take it section by section as we begin on Thursday night uh, studying what this book of Ephesians truly is all about. All right, so let's uh, bow our heads in prayer right now as we close. Father, we just thank you for uh, your word. We thank you for uh, the great power that you've given to us and all the grace that you pro provide and pour out onto us each and every day. And we especially thank you for your word and, and this book, uh, the book of Ephesians, that is designed to strengthen us and empower us so that we stand firm, walking in your will and plan each and every day to your glory. So, Father, we ask that you give us travel blessings on the way home this evening and that you lead us in our day tomorrow to your praise and glory in Christ's name. Amen. And with that, you are dismissed.